All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. Let all who have cause to plead draw near. Give attention. You will be heard. God save these United States, the great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Ladies and gentlemen, the Florida Supreme Court, please be seated. Good morning and welcome to the Florida Supreme Court. Our first case today is advisory opinion to the Attorney General Ray limiting government interference with abortion, number 2023-1392. Good morning, Your Honors. As the Chief Justice said, we are here on the Attorney General's petition for an advisory opinion concerning the proposed ballot initiative entitled Limit Government Interference with Abortion. Uh, my name is Nathan Forrester. I am representing the Attorney General. And with me is Matt Staver, representing Florida Voters Against Extremism, who will also speak in opposition to the amendment. I intend to use 12 of my 15 minutes for the main, the main argument and th reserve three minutes for rebuttal. And Mr. Staber will speak for five minutes. The proposed amendment here should not be placed on the ballot because it is misleading in multiple respects. First, it is affirmatively misleading because it tells voters something about the amendment that is literally untrue. It promises that after the amendment, quote, no law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion in either of two circumstances, before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health. And in point of fact, federal law, the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act, already does restrict abortion in both these circumstances and would continue to do so even if the amendment passes. Counsel, it sounds like you're describing it as a descriptive statement of the world as opposed to a command in the Constitution. Congress shall make no law does not mean that, as a descriptive state, Congress can't try to make a law, for example, that in infringes on the right of free speech. Um, I wonder if, if we can establish early on what degree of knowledge we should attribute to the voter in understanding that, obviously, on passing the amendment, the amendment has some effect. It doesn't mean that, just like that, all laws are you know, that might touch on this are descriptively gone. It's a, it's a prospective statement of what the law will be after the change. Do you not agree with that? I, I don't think I disagree, Your Honor. Um, the approach this court has taken has been to assume, I believe, that the language in the ballot summary is, in fact, descriptive about the state of the world. That seems to have been the approach that this court took in the adult use, first adult use of marijuana case, where the, the, the device there was that it used the word permits, suggesting that, as a universal matter, the use of marijuana up to a certain quantity floor <laughs> would be permitted. And this court said that wasn't good enough. It, um, it didn't ascribe to voters in that case a, 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 an awareness of the federal system and necessarily an awareness of the Controlled Substances Act having a, a preemptive effect. Well, yeah, um, and your opponents in this case, I think, have done an admirable job, and I'd like to hear your response to their argument that that, that is distinguishable, right, this argument that when we – were confronted with language that affirmatively permitted conduct that was in fact precluded by federal law. That's different from a facial challenge to a a statement of what the law is. Actually, there there is a federal law that would you know the Partial Birth Abortion Act wouldn't cover the same universe, the whole entire universe of this field. And so that's a little different than saying what it permits. Or is there no distinction in your mind? I, I actually think the no law shall language is 
more of an affirmative declaration about the state of the world. It has this universal quality to it. The, the, the verb permits invites consideration of what the subject of permits is, namely the amendment. That could lead a voter to understand we're talking there just about Florida law. No law shall, again, has this uh, universal connotation, I think, to, but, to but, the voter. But they, it couldn't possibly be understood that the Florida Constitution would limit the congressional power to pass a law, could it? I believe, again, this is, goes, goes to the answer I gave to Justice Coriel's question, that the, the approach this court has taken is to view these as descriptive promises about what's going on in the world. So it's effectively saying that there is no federal law that's going to get in your way as well. It's not necessarily saying Congress wouldn't have the power, but currently you, are, you would be free. And that seems to be a, a, a problem under the approach this court has taken. Could I ask you to address kind of a different, uh, a different question? Uh, what is your view of our role under 101-161 in reviewing the summary? Um, what exactly are we looking for when we're looking for an explanation of the chief purpose? I mean, that's our mandate. Uh, you know, what does that mean? Are we looking as to what the, does the summary describe what the amendment says? Or does the summary describe what the amendment does? Those are two different questions, yeah. and which one would you do you think is the approach, either what we've done in the past or what you view as what we should do uh, when approaching that question? Yeah, I think it's the latter, it's what the amendment does, not, not simply what it says. Uh, I believe this court has said time and again that the purpose of requiring the statement of the that the chief purpose, the explanatory statement of the chief purpose, is to communicate the material effects to the voter. So that speaks in terms of what the amendment actually does and not merely what it says. Could you address, does the state have a position on whether uh, an unborn child at any stage of pregnancy is covered by um, Article One, Section 2, the basic rights provision? And the reason I'm asking is we have a lot of precedent from the court saying that um, one of the things that a summary has to do is identify the effect of any proposal on other constitutional provisions. And it seems like it's kind of self-evident that the proposal gives people notice that it's going to affect legislative power. Um, but it seems like the issue of whether the unborn have any rights under Article One, Section 2, independently of whatever is a matter of grace the legislature might want to do, or as an exercise of legislative authority. It seems like this, this proposal kind of assumes that the Constitution is currently silent on that issue. And, and if that assumption is wrong, then it seems like it might have implications for, for what we need to do here. Right. I, 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 we, we, we just haven't taken a position on, on that, Your Honor. Um, Do you think that we can decide this without ourselves having an understanding of what the current state of the Constitution is? I mean, it seems like a lot of, a lot of our law here in this area is designed to make sure that the people are aware of what is the constitutional baseline against which they're supposed to consider a proposal. And I'm not sure that we... I mean, it's a t I think I consider it myself kind of a tough issue, and I'm very curious to hear what you say and what the other side says. But I'm not sure that we can really make a judgment as to how the people are informed about this through the not, you know, obviously there's a limited amount that the ballot summary can do and everything. But if, if sort of the bare minimum is that people need to be on notice as to what does the Constitution do now and what are you proposing to change, can we evaluate that without taking a position on whether the current Constitution legally, not morally or politically or whatever, but legally speaks to this issue of uh, any kind of rights for the unborn under this Declaration of Rights provision. Yeah, I mean, I will confess to you, Your Honor, I haven't, this is not an argument that I had thought about, so I'm, I'm Speaking a little bit off the cuff here, but I do I do see the potential for that argument to be viable under the approach this court has taken in cases like Askew v. Firestone, where the you had a a ballot summary that was literally 
accurate, reflecting what the amendment said, but it failed to disclose an important <laughs> background fact about the law, which was in that case that the effect of the amendment there was actually going to be loosening rather than tightening the restrictions on, on, on lobbyists. So that does seem like support for the argument you make. It would require then taking a position on Article One, Section 2. And you asked me whether we have one. I, I'm, I don't believe that we have formulated one on that. But What's your opinion on what we should do? I mean, you know, it seems like, I mean, I've tried to read through all of our cases. We, we clearly haven't directly analyze this issue, but the Constitution says what it says, the words mean what they mean. I, I'm not trying to announce any kind of, you know, my own view as to what they might mean, but, uh, you know, it certainly seems, you know, it talks about all natural persons are equal before the law and have inalienable rights. I don't know that I could kind of affirmatively say that the term, you know, natural person doesn't, as a matter of just sort of ordinary meaning, include the unborn. I mean, we certainly talk about the unborn that way. Um, so I'm just, I don't, I mean, I'm curious as to what your view is as to whether the court needs to have a view on that in order to be able to decide this case. I don't think you need to have a view on that because we think there are plenty of other sufficient grounds for deeming this uh, ballot initiative, this ballot summary here to be misleading. Um, it's an intriguing argument, and again, it's just not, that's not one that I have, have, have thought about before. Um, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't say it's beyond the purview of this court to take into consideration. Uh, Counsel, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, other than the single subject requirement, uh, does the Constitution itself place limitations on the substance of initiative uh, petitions or initiative amendments? Well, this court has said that there is an implicit accuracy requirement in Article 11, um, and that the well, that, that's about uh, have, have, we primarily said that in the context of the summaries, correct? It informs the requirement that the but summary accu be accuracy accurate. is kind of a different question than what is contained in the substance of the amendment of a proposed amendment. Oh, I, if, if you're asking whether it's appropriate to review the substance of the amendment, substance of the amendment, I think this court has said clearly that no, that's not the purpose of the review at this stage. Uh, you, you're reviewing whether it's misleading, whether it violates a single but, subject, but whether it violates a single subject. When I read your brief, it, it sounds like you, you think that there are ef effective substantive limitations on what can be an amendment because in, in, in the proposed amendment, because you basically assert if the words are ambiguous, right. um, at least at some level, um, then the, that cannot be proposed to the people. Is that correct? And, and if, if it is correct, where is that in the Constitution? Yes. Where, 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 is, where does the Constitution have such a limitation on the it, initiative process? It's, it's not precisely what we're saying. We, we are saying that the ballot summary is misleading and that the, the mere fact that it tracks the language of the amendment is not sufficient to relieve it but, of the requirement. But how can a ballot summary be less ambiguous than the text it is summarizing? If it, because it, but then it's just got to take a, a position on issues that are, are ambiguous. If the ballot summary carries forward the ambiguity without clarification and the requirement in the, in the statute, section 101, Point one six one is to have an explanatory statement. If the ballot summary doesn't do that, then the, the ballot summary is misleading. That may have an upstream effect on what sponsors are able to propose in the sense that it may make it more, more difficult to, to compose text that adequately explains an ambiguous term, and, but that is their burden under the statute. Is what you're arguing on that point equally applicable to amendments that are proposed by the legislature? Uh, I believe that is correct, Your Honor. But I guess the point of the questions, though, is, I mean, the summary cannot legally, you know, the, the proposal, the whatever the words are in the proposal, they mean what they mean. The summary can't sort of be a way to sort of dictate what the meaning of the language is. And so it seems, 
it seems like you're asking the summary to do something that it kind of legally can't do because we, you know, the whatever the sort of intended meaning of the sponsor might be or the intended application might be. I mean, that's that might be a relevant consideration, but that doesn't define the meaning of the words. And so it seems like by you're asking, you're sort of inviting us to give a legal effect to the summary that's kind of inconsistent with the way we view the law in general. Well, I mean. I do believe, again, that the ballot summary has to be an explanatory statement, so it does need to explicate in some fashion. I, I'm, I'm aware of at least one first DCA case that actually looked to the ballot summary to inform the meaning of the, um, the amendment itself, and I do think it would be at least persuasive evidence of how the, the, um, the language of the amendment itself was understood by voters at the time, the time of the framing, so I, um, I don't necessarily view what you're describing as a as a, as advice here. Okay, you have uh, you're into your rebuttal time, but you're you're welcome to wrap up or. <laughs> okay, well, to be honest, for all the reasons I, I have said, we believe the um, the ballot summary here is at least affirmatively misleading. I didn't really get to my argument as to why it is also misleading in other respects, but uh, for those reasons, we think it should be in, invalidated. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Matt Staver. I represent uh, Liberty Council and Florida Voters Against Extremism. This amendment should not be approved because it violates the single subject rule. There's four words that doom this amendment. No law shall restrict. That is breathtakingly broad, and it substantially disrupts the functions of all three branches of government. This amendment says no law shall restrict, in addition to the other prohibitions, prohibit prohibit, penalize, and delay. That means no law. That means no parental consent. That means no health. Well, the parental consent, there is an express carve out for the portion of our Constitution that does that. Parental notification, Your Honor, not right. parental consent. That's fair. I guess here's, here's what I'm working through on this argument. Um, if I understand your position, you're saying this is a wolf, and a wolf it may be, but it seems like our job is to answer whether it is a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's all we get to do. And it seems to me that you may be right. This may be as sweeping as you say. It may be that it wipes away all regulation of abortion. It makes it so that, uh, I mean, the list of healthcare providers includes tattoo artists. Yes. It could be that a tattoo artist is involved in, in this. Or it could not. We don't know. I guess my point is, by coming in and telling us this is a wolf, we may find that very persuasive from the standpoint of whether or not to vote in favor of the amendment. But it seems to me like that's not the question before the court. The, court, the question before us is, 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 this, is this hiding a ball in some meaningful way? Or should we not say, you know, the voters can look at this and say, gee, that sounds really sweeping. Let's not approve this. Your Honor, I think the, this court and its precedents have strictly construed and applied the single subject rule. And two aspects of it is, does the particular amendment substantially alter the forms of government? In this case, it does, all three branches. And does it engage in law rolling? It does. And it's strictly construed when that happens. And it's a legal question, not a factual question. So it is clearly within this court's preview. Because what we have here is on the face of it, as a legal matter, it says no law shall restrict. That means nothing. I don't know how you have a law that doesn't restrict. Every law restricts something. Every regulation restricts something. But if you're right, and that's clear on the face of the proposal, what are we to do about it? Strike it down and not allow it, because that cannot go on the ballot to substantially alter the functions, particularly of not just one, but of all three branches of government. This court has struck down amendments that were proposed that would substantially alter the function of one aspect of government, the legislature, for example, in terms of taxing or other kinds of revenue bonds and so forth. But this does all three. So the legislature cannot enact anything, nothing. No matter how egregious the situation, the legislature cannot remedy whatever bad situations or bad actors are taking well, place. Counsel, I mean, we've got a provision in the Constitution 
now that uh, says no law shall be passed to restrain or abridge the liberty of speech or of the press. Now, if somehow we had that had been omitted, and we were faced with um, an initiative to add such language, it sounds like to me your argument would be to say that we'd have to strike that too. Yeah, well, there's four ways. Well, how, how is that substantially different? Because there's four ways to amend the Constitution, and uh, Section 3 of Article 11 is the only one that has the single subject. The other three ways, the convention, the... But you're saying it, that if that were actually up in an initiative, we didn't have it in the Constitution, and it was proposed in an initiative, we would have to strike it under the principles you're articulating. I'm saying that that would be a very close call, and because that... Drastic language here, but here it's not just this. It's no law shall restrict, penalize, prohibit, or delay. Those are all four different kinds of categories of restrictions. And it puts it all together in one. So it not only disables the legislature, but the executive with the Agency for Healthcare Administration, they can't do any remedy or regulation with regards to medical practitioners or licensing. And this court is only going to have one option, and that is to strike down a law, because every law that comes before it is restrictive. Well, I mean, I don't understand why you would be arguing, from given your position on this stuff, that that, that's, that that would be the legal effect of the amendment. I mean, these guys are going to be dusting off their, you know, Thayer articles about, you know, it has to be irreconcilable and all that stuff. I mean, there's going to be, this is, this will be, if this were to become part of the Constitution, it will be litigated, you know, forever. But let me ask you, if the principle that you would be asking us to establish, what effect would that have if someone were to come forward and propose an amendment on the other side that said, you know, no law shall, you know, fail to guarantee the rights of, you know, unborn children to life or something. I mean, would that, is that something that would be off the table from an initiative perspective too? Well, I think in answer to your earlier question, I think the uh, article that you mentioned actually is something that is of a concern because in addition to not my argument but the previous argument is the voter needs to be apprised of does this amendment affect other constitutional provisions? And, whether this court has ruled on it or not, at least in the ballot summary, the amendment should apprise the voter of the breadth of this particular law or this particular amendment and the implications that it has for other existing constitutional provisions, none of which are done in this amendment. 75 words is what they had. They used 49. They could have done a lot more in that particular ballot summary than they did. But with regard to It would be very unusual the, for this court to punish a party for brevity. No, that's true. The briefs are no longer really briefs. But you can, I see you can my, have my time You can have 30 out. seconds to finish. Uh, but I would say, Your Honor, that um, in this case, the breadth of those four words, prohibit, penalize, delay, and restrict, nothing with regards to abortion, really disables all three branches of government. And those cases will come before this court. But when you read no law shall restrict and there's a law before you that has restricted prior to viability, it's going to be struck down. It's a total abolition of all the functions of those three branches of government with regards to the issue of abortion. For those reasons, we respectfully request that this court not approve it for the ballot. Thank you. May it please the court, I'm Courtney Brewer on behalf of the amendment sponsor, Floridians Protecting Freedom. The people of Florida's right to amend their constitution is fundamental to our state's democracy. Seeking to exercise that right, nearly a million Floridians and counting have made clear that they want to vote on the amendment before this court. This amendment follows the directive given by the U.S. Supreme Court in Dobbs that the people should decide how their state may govern abortion. And in crafting the amendment title and summary, the sponsor followed the directives and guidance given by this court and the Constitution on the two issues before the court today. Counsel, the I'm sorry. I think you're going to have a lot of questions, so sure. I want to get those started. Um, we have a line of cases uh, that said the summary must provide fair notice of the effects of the amendment. Sometimes we've said material effects. Sometimes we've said legal effect. But it seems to be... Sort of, if, if there's a major change to the status quo of, of what has been sort of known or regulated before, 
that that is something the voter should be aware of. Um, how would you address that with, with these concerns? Because there, there are things that the amendment would change that are not addressed clearly. Um, and I think, you know, you could have multiple interpretations, but is there any, um, any responsibility? Do we need to look at that summary to see if it is describing those effects so that a reasonable voter understands what they're voting for? Your Honor, a reasonable voter has all the fair notice they need in this case because the language of the amendment is the same as the language in the summary for all practice. But we've, we've said several times parroting is not necessarily explanatory. Uh, that's true, Your Honor. You've also said many times that the, the, the analysis under the summary and title is easily met when the language is the same. In those instances where you have found uh, that it wasn't enough, such as the Askew case. There it was, the amendment was replacing uh, another provision of the Constitution and was constricting rights. And, and the court said, had it been a totally new provision, uh, the way the summary is presented would have been okay. Um, and it well, wasn't the problem in Askew that the proposed amendment was in effect permitting something when it said it was prohibiting something? Yes, Your Honor. It was misleading. Uh, it, it misled as to the chief purpose of the amendment, which was to permit something that had therefore had before then been prohibited. And here, there is nothing misleading. They have the opponents have not identified anything misleading about this amendment. Hasn't the case law distinguished between those cases where the undefined terms there would be a disconnect between the operative legal effect and then the voter's understanding? Would you agree that's a fair statement of the case law? I would agree, that, yes, Your Honor, I would agree that in people's property rights, I think, is, is the main case that the opponents point to on that. And so why, why is there not a disconnect here? Um, I think the sponsor's brief <laughs> reflects kind of a clear understanding of what viability means, of what patient's health means, um, and the significance of this comma. And so how do we expect the voters to understand the legal effect when there is, there's no explanation at all given as to a legal effect other than parroting? Because the words that are used are understood by voters in the context in which they are used, there is no question that voters understand what viability means in the abortion context. This is a term uh, and its meaning that have become a part of the cultural fabric of our nation. Voters discuss this Is term. it the sponsor's position that the voters would also understand that viability is limited by this last clause as determined by the patient's health care provider? Yes, Your Honor. It is the sponsor's position, absolutely, that how, voters how would... How would a voter understand the difference between application of a last antecedent clause and a series qualifier canon, just from viewing the language as written? Because of, uh, well, two reasons, Your Honor. One, just grammatical rules that I think in our brief we point out that um, the Eleventh Circuit referred to these as ordinary rules of grammar. The Supreme Court just used it in the Facebook case. Um, but also because this is the this is consistent with the way viability has always been determined. Viability has always been determined by it healthcare hasn't, providers. Though every every law that's been passed in Florida has been a categorical ban at a certain week. And so why would it not be, why would it be unreasonable for a voter to read this language and say, I'll vote for it because the legislature will be able to, you know, have a ban at 21 weeks um, with exceptions for the health of the mother. Why would that be an unreasonable conclusion by a voter? It would be unreasonable because it would be inconsistent with the language of the amendment and uh, voters. That would be it, a surprise to a lot of voters, wouldn't it? I, I disagree, Your Honor. I think that the voters are perfectly capable of reading this language and understanding it and would understand the ins and outs of it. And also, in Florida Education Association, this court said it's not what certain voters might believe it's whether the amendment and the summary have given them fair notice of what and they're voting on. And that's on. the issue, right, the legal effects. So there's, there's two scenarios. Either the words are undefined and it'll be played out later down the line, in which case the voters are not advised of that. Um, or this has a very clear meaning and the voters are not advised of the fact that this is going to shift policy making from the legislature to this expert class of doctors to determine the conditions under which people can end lives in Florida. And so I'm wondering why if those are one of the two scenarios, then why neither of those are explained to the voters? It's explained to the voters because the language of the amendment is, is clear. The court has not required definitions 
before of terms that voters would understand in the context it's in which they are and made. so I guess does that is that what your argument turns on then so you're not really taking issue with the the premise that we review ballot summaries for their legal effect you're saying this does not fail under that con concept because these terms are so clear I, I think I'm saying both I, I, I am I am saying that the terms are clear in context that this court has never struck an amendment under these circumstances and I'm also um, saying that uh, you know voters understand what is before them that if a voter doesn't like uh, this amendment they are perfectly capable of voting against it if they don't like uh, but voters have seen and, and, and deserve the chance to vote on and include in their constitution uh, what happens when these decisions are taken away from health care providers and put in the hands of politicians. <laughs> and if, uh, again, if a voter does not want that, if they, they, they can vote against this amendment and uh, there will not be uh, this de determination left to the health care provider to determine when viability. There's nothing, though, on the face of the amendment that if it were to become law that would say that the legislature can't sort of adopt a kind of generic definition of viability that a health care provider would then be the one to sort of decide whether factually in a particular case that's been met, right? There's nothing that changes the role of the legislature, Your Honor, to be sure. Um, and let me ask you about this personhood issue because it seems like um, I could think that everything that the that everything that the that the summary says in and of itself is okay, but then there's this issue of, you know, does our case law stand for the proposition that if you're going to substantially alter an existing part of the Constitution, it needs to be identified for the voter? I think there's lots of cases that say that. Then the question becomes, you know, does this essentially have the effect of changing Article 1, Section 2, and that's not something that's, you know, flagged for the voter at all. What's your position on that? Well, Your Honor, I, I, would, I think the AG doesn't even have a position on whether that uh, constitutional provision would apply in the circumstances in which you're suggesting. Uh, if, if this court had that argument before it, that this amendment was passed and uh, it was there was a conflict between it and Article One, Section Two. Uh, then this court can balance the different rights at that time. But, but because I'm, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but don't the voters need? I mean, the whole. I think the logic of our, the logic of our precedent in this area is that the voters are supposed to be the ones doing the balancing. I mean, this this proposed amendment is. I'm not, when I say that it's kind of one-sided, I don't mean that it's one-sided in any kind of deceptive way, but it kind of assumes that the Constitution as it exists right now is silent as to, as to any rights of the unborn. And I don't know if, if that assumption is correct. And so I guess, I mean, maybe a more direct question for you would be, can we say as a matter of law that the term all natural persons excludes unborn children? I don't think that that is a question that would come before this court. No, I'm uh, asking right now, under right. the existing right. Constitution. I mean, this is the Constitution. We're looking at the words. We need to understand if this proposal would change that or, or affect it. You know, in Roe versus Wade, the majority opinion said that if the unborn are quote unquote persons, then it kind of throws the entire analysis off. And I know academics have sort of questioned whether that was true, but I mean that, you know, the way this has been traditionally viewed is that if you really, if you view it as the rights of a of the woman and the rights potentially even unborn, that kind of changes the equation if you're just comparing the rights of the woman to the sort of authority of the state and whatever interest they, they may want to pursue. So do you have any authority under Florida law that would allow us to say that natural persons does not include the unborn? I don't think there's any authority under Florida law to say that it does include the unborn. And so what you would be asking amendment sponsors to do is to think of all the ways that a constitutional, another provision of the Constitution might be interpreted and to somehow communicate that to the voters. Um, and you're losing, uh, I think in that instance, we would really lose the clarity that, uh, and, and, the, and what the Constitution requires a, a proposed amendment to say. Should it matter that for a hundred years, so this revision, this language is from 1968, should it matter that for a hundred years the law of Florida was that 
basically through the homicide laws and the abortion laws. I mean, they can only be read as sort, of, sort of making sense if the unborn child is some kind of a person, whether it's, you know, legally, whether you have to treat born and unborn exactly the same. That's kind of a separate issue. But I'm just asking just sort of as a matter of language and is how we, using all the tools in the toolbox for how we sure. interpret the meaning of sure. terms. Your Honor, I just, I come back to, it's it's not the question before this court. We'd be weighing, it, I mean, the, if the sponsor had to include something like that in the um, amendment, we'd be weighing into uh, an, an issue in the Constitution that hasn't even been fleshed out before this court. And I would also note that the sponsor's intent on how this would interact uh, is not determinative uh, to this court long term. Uh, J Chief Justice Muniz, you said in your dissent in all voters vote that a sponsor's stated interpretations of a proposed amendment cannot trump the plain meaning of the amendment's text. And so uh, what the amendment is that we have put that we hope to put before the voters, that we will put before the voters, uh, is entirely reflected by the ballot summary well, that, and the Sorry. I was going to say that it's, it's quite right that the, the text trumps, but I, I wonder whether that helps when it comes to the collateral effects. Like I, I, to pick up on, on a different thread of the argument here, is, is it your position that the, a reasonable voter would understand that this does away with all existing regulation of uh, where an abortion can be performed, for example? Because the plain effect of the text, say your opponents, say, I think, you know, could say a reasonable reader of this language, is indeed quite sweeping and might have that effect. Your Honor, the plain language does not say anything about, uh, it does not limit the state in its ability to regulate health care. Oh, well, it, but it does. See, here I disagree with you. The, the plain text of the language says you can't delay an abortion. Well, causing someone to go to a licensed clinic might be a delay as opposed to, I don't know, using some abortive fashion at home, right? Uh, there are, uh, well, allow me to rephrase then, Your Honor. There are, of course, uh, regulation is uh, encompasses prohibitions. It encompasses penalizations, but it, those terms do not encompass all regulations that the state may uh, may impose. Uh, there is no contention that the neutrally neutral, generally applicable health and safety regulations are going to prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortions and would not be prohibited by oh, this but, amendment. But, but we have, you know, maybe 50 years of abortion jurisprudence where so much of the fight was about delay or restrict when it was about, you know, regulation, right? So I'm not sure, here I think your intent is peeking in in a way that you just said was not acceptable. Well, of course, it, it, if there was a regulation that was challenged as being a prohibition, delay, restriction, or uh, penalizing abortion, uh, it would be back before this court. It will be before this court to make that determination. And so what our intent is would not matter. Um, this court very well knows how to uh, analyze statutes uh, and, and analyze them under the framework of constitutional amendments. Uh, it would be a huge shift for this court to say that, you know, every regulation that might come under fire would need to be addressed uh, before the voters. It would effectively take away uh, the voters' right to amend their constitution, which is a sacrosanct right and part of our organic law in this Do you state. Counsel, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, let me, I, I want to ask this question. I want you to respond directly to the argument made by opponent uh, Susan B. Anthony when they say that essentially the chief purpose um, that is not communicated by um, the amendment, the proposed amendment, is that we would be enshrining in constitutional cement, I think is what they said, uh, abortion without restriction for the entire nine, month, nine months of pregnancy. And that is not being communicated to the voters um, in the way that the language of the, the ballot summary is, um, the summary and the, the, the amendment is drafted now. And that is important because abortion is different, right, according to, to Dobbs. It's a different issue. And it has divided uh, everyone according to, you know, their personal beliefs. So isn't that part of the, the job of the proposed amendment 
to make sure that they are communicating the chief purpose and the effect of what it is that this proposed amendment would actually do? Your Honor, I don't know how an amendment could better communicate the chief, its chief purpose via a summary than uh, by putting the language of the amendment in the summary. The, the voters will have that language in the ballot box with them. The, the whole purpose of the summary needing to be clear and, and unambiguous about the chief purpose is because often voters don't have that language in the ballot box with them. But here they will. And this court has said as long ago as uh, nearly 50 years ago in Smathers versus Smith that the summary should ni be neither no less nor more extensive than the amendment appears to be. And also in Detzner versus Anstead in 2018, that Florida law doesn't require that a summary do more than communicate what voters are being asked to approve or reject. And by putting the language of the amendment into the summary, that is accomplished here, and this court has repeatedly said that the summary and title provisions are easily satisfied when that's the case. So this is a wolf that comes as a wolf. I mean, the summary is pretty, if people think that this is sweeping, I mean, the summary makes it pretty obvious that it's sweeping. Yes, and if voters don't uh, uh, agree with that, they will have the opportunity to vote against it. Uh, but the arguments about what this amendment will do uh, that's that's not the uh, this is not the time and place for that and they, and they those are arguments that the AG may certainly make uh, on the stump but they are not arguments appropriate for this court's analysis right now about whether the summary clearly states the purpose and if I may just briefly respond to the single subject argument um, uh, this amendment deals with a single subject it limits government interference with abortion. Uh, it just requires the government to comply with the Constitution, which the government knows how to do. Uh, it, although it describes the types of government interference limited and in what circumstances they're limited, it's really this idea of two sides of the same coin, as this court has said in previous uh, cases on this. This court has emphasized repeatedly how reluctant it is to remove an amendment from the people's sanctified right of self-determination. It should not do so here, where the sponsor followed the framework established in other cases and the Constitution, using the same understandable language in the summary and the amendment and addressing only one subject. Instead, the people of Florida should be able to exercise their voice and vote on this amendment. Thank you. You can, you can have two minutes for rebuttal. It's not enough simply to track the language of the amendment, the language of the amendment itself is of such elasticity that an enormously wide range of meanings will attach to it and voters will not actually understand what they are, are voting for. It seems, I mean, I, my, my problem with that whole argument though is it goes back to what Justice Kennedy was saying, which is you're essentially Put it, you're, the only the only consequence if we were to adopt that kind of a reading of this is that it would have a it would dramatically change the substance of what could be proposed. I mean, all these things that are supposedly you know up in the air about this, which I agree are going to have to be worked out over time if this were to become part of the Constitution. I mean, there's no possible way that a summary could tick through all these different you know, all these different variables and possible implications and everything, you know, there, I mean, A, there's no clear answer to these questions. Well, it, and it, the it, summary says what it says. I mean, people can see for themselves if it's too broad or vague or whatever, indeterminate. I'm and, and, and if a summary engages in this interpretive enterprise, then the people who are opposed to it will be coming in and saying, no, that's not the, the correct interpretation. That's not what it says, and it's subject to other interpretations. It just seems like you, it imposes an impossible burden on uh, the people proposing an amendment. Um, and it seems like to me all these things have to be argued about in the political process, um, and it's, because otherwise it, it's, it is a restriction on the substance of what can be proposed. That is not in the, we're, we're not given the power in the Constitution to impose such a restriction. Uh, I, I take your point, Justice Kennedy, but it doesn't seem a bad thing 
that if the effect of the ballot summary requirements is that the amendment itself must be more clear or else must be explained more clearly by the ballot summary, that that's what the sponsors have to do. Because otherwise, the voters don't know what they're voting for. And that's the whole purpose of the, the basically the truth and packaging law that is section 101.161. You end up getting a but group the, but of- the, can, Do you think the legislature can impose a substantive requirement on what can be proposed in an amendment? Because it, 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 it to, at the end of the day, that seems like what you're saying, is that we can, we can through that, uh, that requirement of general law, actually restrict uh, the substance of what is an amendment. Well, again, the, the sponsor would have two options. One is to explain. The other is to revise the amendment. Um, so it's not necessarily imposing a substantive limitation on what can be put in the amendment. Um, but the problem is that what you what you have done here is you've created a Rorschach test of court of source where voters look at this language and they attach widely different meanings to it, but they may end up voting on the same side of the issue despite having sharply different views about what the amendment actually does. You end up with a, a literally inaccurate final count on the on the ballot. And that is that is the fundamental purpose of all, all these mechanisms that are laid out in the Constitution and by statute. Um, the constitutionality of Section 101.161 has, has been accepted, and that does, in some sense, constrain how, how ballot summaries are done. It, it, in um, the insofar as it has this indirect upstream effect on how, how the amendment itself would be phrased, because that is one option for carrying ambiguity, I just don't see how that could can be a bad thing. And as to the the, the Wolf and I see I've already. Go, go ahead. <laughs> the, the, the wolf in sheep's clothing argument, um, this gets back again to the, the voters need to know the effects of what's going on here. What I, I am hearing is that, um, no, this amendment is actually very, very broad. It's unambiguously broad. I don't think the, the ballot summary adequately discloses that potentiality. Some voters may suss it out. Other voters will not. And the that's failure just not, I mean, the, you know, prohibit, penalize, delay, restrict. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that this is, try, you know, there's going to be debates about what are the gaps and what can the legislature do. But it's pretty obvious that this is, uh, you know, a pretty uh, aggressive, comprehensive approach to dealing with, with this issue. And, and if it were to, you know, the voters can kind of argue about whether, you know, they want something more nuanced than that. I mean, it. It just doesn't seem like this is really trying to be deceptive. I mean, I, as you as I've asked through my questions, I think there may be a problem with what it doesn't disclose. But I mean, it's pretty self-evidently broad. That being the case, um, I would say that the title of this is understated to the point of deception. Limit government interference. What you're talking about is that it unambiguously would eviscerate government interference with abortion. So, what, what title would work? <laughs> I, I, and that's not really your prohibit. obligation, but I'm just curious if you if you have an idea about what title would prohibit. work. Prohibit. Pardon? Prohibit. Prohibit has a stronger connotation. I mean, I, it's not my job, to, obviously, to do this the sponsor's work, but there are, there are better words. Limit has a sense of not going as far as all the way. But, I mean, you agree that we have gazillions of cases where we've said that you read the title together with the rest of the summary and I mean you know prohibit would obviously that would be a that would be a misstatement of the of the amendment I mean if you read the all of it together it's people the people of Florida aren't stupid I mean they can figure this out I think there may be a problem as to what it doesn't say well, if, if the as determined by clause actually does modify all the terms that precede it, I'm not sure there are any limits, and prohibit might well be a more accurate description of what's going on. I'm not saying we're endorsing that as the, the, the best reading of this, but it's a potential reading. It's one that some voters may see, some voters may not. That confusion, that voter confusion, distorts the final outcome, and that's the, that's the fundamental problem we see here. Um, I. See, I've well exceeded my time. We helped so. you. <laughs>
I'm sorry? We helped you exceed your time. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Your Honors. And again, for the reasons that we have like, set forth, we submit that this court should strike this ballot initiative from the, from the November ballot. Thank you. Thank you very much. The court will take a uh, quick break. Thanks.
some of your water.
All rise. Ladies and gentlemen, the Florida Supreme Court is now in session. Please be seated. We will now take up citizens of the state of Florida versus uh, Andrew Giles Fay, case number 2022-1733. Thank you and good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court and counsel, my name is Allie Westling and I represent the Florida Office of Public Counsel as well as the customers of Florida Power and Light, Duke Energy Florida, Tampa Electric Company, and the Florida Public Utilities Company. I'll start by acknowledging that there are a lot of briefs and large records in this matter, um, but what I wanna be very clear about is that OPC's argument throughout the litigation and throughout this entire appellate process is the same. The Commission has failed to fulfill its legislative mandate of ensuring that utility investments are prudent and cost-effective. Well, I think first we have to establish whether that mandate needs to be effectuated now, at this point, this juncture, or whether the appropriate standard is a public interest one, and if those two things are different, how they're different. So perhaps you can say a little bit about the difference between the public interest review and the prudence review to the extent that you think there is a difference. Certainly, Your Honor, and there has been a lot of case law um, on uh, one, and, uh, one of these issues separately and together, but um, overall, Chapter 366, as the court has recently stated, is governed by a public interest standard. The whole, the whole chapter is in existence for the public interest, and within that chapter, 366, 36606 specifically requires a prudence review so in the, to the extent that a prudence review is required by, to, to fulfill How are the they public different? interest. Are they different? Um, they, are, they are different, Your Honor, but you can't have one without the other. The court has previously stated in the Sierra Club case that imprudent investments of millions of dollars would likely conflict with a public interest finding. So they, you well, can't that's, have- Well, that's true, but in Sierra Club versus Brown, we still embrace a public interest uh, test. Yes, sir. And then make that note about what would likely be true. Here, the statute, the storm protection plan statute is a little different in that we have a chronologically staged review, right? Every three years, we've got sort of a, a different test than we do ab initio. That seems to me to reflect in the structure of the legislation a choice about what to do. There's, I mean, there is, there is no mention of prudence ab initio. It shows up in the three year, you know, sort of, um, refresher, if you will. Don't we ascribe to that legislative choice some meaning, or is it from your perspective indifferent? I would respectfully disagree that the, the issue every three years is strictly prudence, or excuse me, public interest, because prudence of investments in every single docket in front of the commission is a statutory requirement in the absence of a settlement agreement, as the court has stated in Sierra Club. So, Prudence of investments in rate-making dockets, which include the SPP and the SPP-CRC process, prudence is always required. And, and as the court is aware, these cases were heavily litigated. This was not a settlement agreement situation. The prudence of these investments, as required by 366-061, is, is always, it always applies. And specifically, Chapter 366-96, the SPP statute, does not contain a notwithstanding 36606 um, statement. But why isn't, why isn't the, the, to the extent that the statute tells the commission that in its review of these plans it has to factor in the estimated costs and benefits to the utility and the customers of making the improvements in the plan, why doesn't that sort of bake what, what you're worried about at, and calling the prudence thing, why isn't that sort of baked into this and to the extent that the commission, you know, abused its discretion because it, you know, kind of arbitrarily ignored that or, you know, if there weren't competent substantial evidence. I mean, isn't that, it seems like we have a very specific statute that does embody this principle that you're worried about. And, you know, because it tells, because the statute says that 
once the plan is approved it the way i understand it is then when you get to the cost recovery part people can argue about whether the plan was implemented in a prudent way but you can't sort of at that stage question well why were you doing this in the first place right you did it perfectly but it was imprudent it seems like that argument gets taken off the table so why isn't what your concerns which are you know understandable and invalid why is it not just handled through you know following the statute and making sure that the commission considers this criteria in the way it's explicitly told to and, and that's exactly our issue your honor we we agree that the statute is clear that the statute when read harmoniously with the always a required re requirement that prudence be considered that the statute is clear it's the Commission's interpretation which must be subject to a de novo review that is the problem here the Commission did not properly conduct the cost effectiveness evaluation that is required by the text of 36696 and the rule that the Commission wrote we have no problem with the statute we have no problem with the rule we have a problem with the way the Commission has interpreted both okay so then instead of sort of having this sort of metaphysical argument about prudence and statutory interpretation it seems like you need to be making a specific argument about how whether you characterize it as abuse of discretion or lack of competent substantial evidence what's your specific argument as to and I guess not all of the utilities are in the same boat right Correct. according to your view of the case so I mean what specifically are we supposed to be you know if we accept that this cost benefit review whatever you want to call it is embedded in sort of the you know this the statutory framework then what did the Commission get wrong I mean what's your argument about what they got wrong specifically there are a couple of things that they got wrong as you identified um, they um, found that all the companies complied with the SBP rule requirements when the there is not competent substantial evidence of that two of the companies did provide the required information um, and two of them did not so that was that's one issue okay so can we take the other two then off the table no your honor okay. um, because the Commission uh, the Commission found explicitly that prudence was outside the scope of the SPP proceeding and they found that as a as it applies to all four cases so even though these utilities the two utilities who did comply with the with the rule and the statute provided the information when the Commission found that prudence was outside the scope of the SPP proceeding that that affects all four did they, but did they say that cost-benefit comparison is outside the scope they didn't say the cost-benefit analysis that's the question right well under yes, the Your statute Honor. what they did say in each order is that neither section 366 96 nor the SPP rule explicitly require a cost-effectiveness evaluation or quantitative cost-benefit analysis they that's what the Commission found and that is our ultimate argument that the prudence and cost-effectiveness that is mandated by the legislature to be conducted was was ignored and and the Commission abdicated its responsibility to conduct that analysis just making sure I understand so you're saying even where you have the statute where there's a very clear sort of bifurcated process that uses very specific words for this first session first section it's public interest for the sec second part and, in, and that part has to have a very specific cost-benefit analysis very specific and then the second part which requires the three-year and prudence and all of that that somehow we sort of assume that there's something else that the legislature intended that overlays that that they just did not really include in their sort of detailed procedures I, I don't know um, if assuming maybe is the right word but if you look at subsection 7 of the SPP statute it says that proceeding with actions to implement an approved storm protection plan shall not be evidence of imprudence that shows the legislature's intent especially knowing that they already had 366 in place and no notwithstanding except that the first word in seven is after after a utilities transmission and distribution storm protection plan has been approved proceeding with actions to implement the plan shall not constitute or be evidence of imprudence I guess what I'm getting at is I get your argument that there is a statutory overlay of prudence I don't dispute that I instead see a very finely wrought statutory scheme that assumes that we know that there is that overlay but here's in 366 speaks more specifically to a new process this SPP process and it balances 
the statute's overarching interests in prudence and public interest in a specific way, by, by doing a public interest determination ab initio, and then, again, to quote the statute, after a utilities transmission and distribution storm protection plan has been approved, evaluates it for prudence. Am I missing something? My understanding that I, I think would answer your question, Your Honor, is that specific statutes only um, override or take precedence over more general statutes when there's a conflict. We do not allege that there's a conflict between the overarching ever-present requirement for prudence and the requirements that um, that these plans be in the public interest. As I said, public interest is, is the is point of the statute, and there's still a requirement that prudence be conducted. I don't understand. I guess I just don't understand why you're even doing, first of all, the 366-061, it's, you know, this isn't a rate-making thing when you're talking about approving the plan. I don't understand why you're introducing this kind of overlay of that when, you know, this doesn't just say public interest and it's up to the, you know, you could imagine a statute that said public interest and it would be a much less bounded sort of act of discretion. I mean, here we have a public interest standard that requires the consideration of these specific things. One of the things is this cost-benefit thing. It just seems like really the whole argument should be kind of focused on just this statute rather than having what I think is kind of a distraction about whether the, you know, the, the other statutes, you know, you need to harmonize them. I mean, this is a very specific thing. So there's two points that will hopefully address your concern. Um, the first is that we do believe that the Storm Protection Plan process is rate making. Um, our reply brief goes into this in greater detail, and I know the court's preference for brevity, so I'm not going to repeat all of that, but we have very clear, strong points about why the SPP process does constitute rate making. The commission is dealing with, they are setting budgets in the SPP process. They are setting billions of dollars worth of budgets. They are pre-approving the expenditure of billions of dollars that customers will have to pay for in the SPP process. And the SPP process and the SPP CRC process are inextricably intertwined. The utilities cannot recover a single penny from customers without both of those processes having taken place. They both result in the charge that, res that shows up on customers' bill every month. They, the SPP process is rate making. And again, I'll rely on our arguments in the reply brief that also further support, th support that point. Um, but, but, the, but the rate making aspect of it only happens in the second phase. I mean, the, the explicit rate making phase of it, right? I would disagree, Your Honor. Um, you think the table set? by the first phase. Correct. And they're kind Honor. of boxed in. Correct, Your Honor. And um, that, like I said, customers or the utilities cannot collect a single penny without both of those processes taking place. Would you help me understand something? How do you, how do you quantify the benefit of a reduction in outage times? Your Honor, two of the utilities did so. I can give you some record sites if you'd like, but they are actually all reflected on the initial brief, page 37. That's where we identify that Tampa Electric Company and Duke Energy of Florida, they hired outside consultants, and those consultants went through a rigorous process. I hate to give them credit, but you know they, they went through a rigorous process of, um, of identifying how to put a dollar number on those benefits, and they did so, and they provided that information consistent with the requirements of the SPP statute and the SPP rule. Unfortunately, two of the companies did not but provide you, you that You put a dollar, but in some ways, I understand you can, put, you can do some magic <laughs> and come up with dollars, dollar numbers, but you're really kind of comparing things that are different sorts of things, right? I mean, once you put a dollar number on it, you compare dollars, huh? But it, there does seem some kind of, something kind of mysterious or arbitrary about that. Well, one thing that um, I think is important to recognize is that um, the benefits of storm protection and of storm hardening are laid out in the statute. And we fully agree that storm hardening is a good thing, reducing outage times, reducing restoration costs. That is a good thing. And whether we agree or not, that's what the statute says. So the, the qualitative benefits of these storm protection plans are already encompassed in the statute. What the statute requires is quantitative information about how these SPPs will actually benefit uh, customers and, and how those benefits relate to the costs. So the, the, the quantitative nature of the word estimate, which again is in both the statute and the commission's own rule, that shows how the, the, the degree of specificity that's required in order to have an accurate comparison 
of the costs and benefits. But you know what it says in the, in the, in the rule, it talks about a description um, that including an estimate of the resulting reduction in outage times and restoration costs due to extreme weather conditions. I'm, I'm trying to see, I'm trying to see here in the text of the rule, which you're not challenging the rule. I mean, you're correct. You're willing to operate within the rule. I'm trying to see where you get to a, a requirement for a quantification of that element. It, our, our view is that that is embedded in the word estimate because, again, the, the qualitativeness of the benefits is laid out. It, it is the statute. The, well, the I understand. The estimate does imply something quantitative, but the, the, what could be quantitatively estimated there is we're going to reduce um, outage times by 20%. That doesn't say anything about a dollar value, or, or we are going to, we're going to reduce it by X number of days. Um, that's what comes to my mind when I read this in context. Where other places they're talking about cost, I, I'm just I'm just struggling to really see the the requirement for something quantitative, a, a dollar quantity associated with that, which is what you say is required. Yes, Your Honor. So the the dollar cost is required in, in the same rule, but when you're talking about the estimates of the reduction in outage times and the reduction in, in restoration costs, obviously the restoration costs would be in a dollar um, and the other would be in a, in a number of minutes. And two of the utilities provided, they, they did that quantification. They, they analyzed their plans, what those plans were meant to achieve, and they came up with minutes. They came up with the number of minutes that, that would be reduced and the restoration costs that would be reduced. So it is possible to, half of the companies did it, but half of them didn't. Okay, how do you compare, well, so there's not a, there's not a monetary um, element to that. Um, it's purely a quantitative assessment of, the, of, of time. Yes, Your Honor. As and opposed to a, a more, um, Qualitative. I would I would say it's uh, it's objective uh, rather than qualitative. Maybe that's a better word to use. But having objective numbers that can be compared to objective costs and then analyzed for cost benefit. But I don't think that, that's really not it, comparing minutes to these these the, the cost and dollars. I don't. <laughs> yeah, I guess I don't know how you compare that. Those are those are incomparable things, this, really. This goes to the same point I, I I was trying to articulate earlier, but I think that, she, that I think. Justice Kennedy has done a better job than I have. What what does what does the order? If you prevail, what does the order on remand say? We ask that the order on remand require the commission to fulfill the legislative mandate of holding the utilities to the requirements of the text of the statute and the rule, and to conduct this prudence and cost effectiveness evaluation to ensure customers aren't paying for these billion dollar investments, which are imprudent. That that's what we are asking. Are for. they presumptively imprudent? Like, why are we presuming that they are imprudent at this time? We, as it stands right now, we don't know. They're not presumptively prudent or imprudent. It's because the commission failed to conduct the review that we don't know that. The harm to customers right now is not that, it's not that they're paying for imprudent investments. It's that they could be paying for imprudent investments because the commission did not do its job. And I'm not sure where I am on time, but um, you have like, two minutes. I'd like to reserve the rest for rebuttal, so please. Thanks. May it please the court. Good morning. I'm Susan Sapasnikoff on behalf of the Florida Public Service Commission. This public, Florida Public Service Commission asked to take 10 minutes of today's time with my esteemed colleague, Dan Norby, reserving the remaining 10 minutes on behalf of the utilities. This court should affirm the five final orders in this consolidated matter for two reasons. First, the commission correctly interpreted and applied the plain language of section 36696. And second, the commission correctly interpreted and applied the plain language of rules 25-6.030 and 25-6.031. 366-96 is a very specific and a very unique statute. In the statute, the legislature requires electric utilities to develop plans to engage in specific storm hardening activities designed to make the electric grid more resilient during extreme weather events. And it also sets forth specific criteria the commission must use to determine if the utility's plans to accomplish those activities 
satisfy the statutory mandate and whether they are in the public interest. Moreover, the statute holds that once a plan has been determined to be in the public interest, the Commission must conduct an annual storm protection cost recovery clause proceeding to determine the utility's prudently incurred costs and allow the utility to recover such costs through a separate, through a charge separate from rates, base rates. So can I stop you right there? Certainly. So the point of that second proceeding is to see whether the plan that was approved has been prudently implemented. So you could have a plan that by design makes sense and would be cost benefit rational, but you then go and actually implement it in a way where you you know, waste money doing it or you hire a bad contractor or you mismanage the project or whatever. And that could that could lead to sort of variables and what kind of cost recovery you have, right? Oh exactly. Okay. So the but you and you agree that the statute itself requires the commission to take into account in some way whether you have a rational fit between the costs of whatever this proposed plan is and what the benefits are going to be, some of which can probably be quantified in dollar amounts, like reduced, you know, uh, uh, costs of, you know, whatever the replacement power, over, and then the downtime, which probably people try to put, you know, dollar values to, but might be more difficult. But you agree that that, the rationality of the fit between whatever the plan is and what that's going to cost and what's on the other side for benefits, you agree that that's part of the first phase review, right? The plan, the Correct. review of the plan itself. Correct. The legislature put forth very specific factors that the, um, the commission had to consider, and those in cost entail looking at costs, looking at benefits, looking at projected rate impact. But when we're at the plan stage, these are 10 year plans, and the statute only asks that we kind of set forth a general roadmap. The rule came in with more specifics, but when we're looking at public interest, the legislature set forth what um, the Commission had to consider, then that gives it the information um, to move into that second phase when you're looking at whether or not they actually prudently did what they told the Commission right. okay. they intended to do. And so explain to us what is the difference between your understanding of what the Commission is supposed to be looking at and what the utilities are supposed to be kind of laying the foundation for versus this prudence review that Council on the other side is asking for. Um, certainly. The Commission has a long-standing decades, I think back at least to 1982, and it's been supported by this Court, a well-established definitions of what prudence is. It looks at what a reasonable utility manager would have done given the information it knew or should have known at the time when it made its decision, and it goes to incurred costs, and even our um, statute talks about incurred costs, which is a backward looking to costs actually done. Now, if we want to use prudence more in the colloquial sense about is this reasonable, is this appropriate, is this a good thing to do, is it meeting the state's interest under the statute, that could be called prudence, but it's not a prudence review. So the legislature clearly said the commission had to perform a public interest determination in the first hearing. Then when we switch over to looking at the actual costs, there's consistent review as to whether or not the managerial decisions that the utilities are making are being done prudently. Okay. So, so what, if I understand what you're saying is that the prudence determination really is a determination that is more appropriate to look at at the implementation phase exactly. as opposed to the long-range plan phase. Yes, sir. But you also would agree, though, that once the plan is approved, when you get to the cost recovery phase, the public council would not be permitted to come in and say, well, why did you, you know, it doesn't seem like this was, you know, the bang for the buck that you get for having done this or that thing. Even if you managed it perfectly and, you know, didn't waste a penny in implementing that, do you agree that under this statutory framework, that type of argument that goes to, like, is it rational to have done this in the first place, that by the terms of the statute, that is taken off the table? Do you agree with that? Right, because they should have made those arguments during the plan hearing and come in with evidence as to whether okay. or not the so plan. That's, so then in other words, so basically, so you agree, and I'm obviously the question is going to be did the commission do mm -hmm. it here, but you agree that the sort of the rationality, the reasonableness of planning to do these projects and spend these estimated amounts of money in exchange for what the benefit is, 
that's all part of the sort of first step review of the plan, right? Right, but in terms of we have our plans and then those have programs and then the programs have individual projects. When we're looking at the plan stage, it's very, you know, it's 10 years out. So the statute and the rules set forth um, specific things that need to be looked at at the first year, going three years out, and then for the rest of the plan. And then as those come back and get revisited at least every three years, those plans are going to come back before the commission. Things get updated, things get reassessed, and that's the opportunity to come in and talk about whether the concept of what you're doing is appropriate. Now, even if that concept is appropriate, um, you can still come back and challenge how those were implemented in the cost recovery clause phase. So there's, you know, multiple portions where this is an ongoing assessment of reasonableness and whether the actions were prudently taken to, to get to those objectives. So the commission then basically under the statutory design, the commission has to be smart about the extent of its approval because once it can say, you know, this sounds pretty good, but we're only going to approve in terms of like locking in the wisdom of doing certain aspects of this plan, we're only going to approve this part of it. And then to the extent that you're projecting 10 years out, we'll get to years, you know, three and beyond when you come back for your update. But essentially, once you have sort of blessed the, you know, the wisdom of a particular project at that level, then essentially that that then is kind of set in stone and really the only thing that's left to fight about in the cost recovery phase is just the actual kind of managerial sort of efficiency and effectiveness of how that was implemented. Is well, that fair? Essentially, yeah, the, the programs are and the projects are in some extent less or more depending on how far out they are given some um, approval by in the, at that plan stage. But then when they come in, you know, the first year in cost recovery you know, that's going to be reassessed. You know, maybe a utility started a, a project and decided not to go forward with it because of cost concerns that came up. Um, you know, if they did go forward with it, again, whether or not they're making prudent decisions and implementing that are still constantly going to be assessed. The language of this statute doesn't make the scrutiny with which the management decisions to implement these projects um, it doesn't make it any less. As a matter of fact, if the OPC got what it's asking for, essentially, that prudence was done at the first stage when we just sort of have this very far-looking information ahead of us, that would then preclude <laughs> any sort of further review in the cost recovery stage. Because prudence is a finality, and if you look at the statute, it talks about, let me make sure I get the language correct here, um, that if the commission can, determines that costs were prudently incurred, those costs will not be subject to disallowance or further prudence review absent certain circumstances. So if we were to make a prudence determination at the plan stage with this far looking, um, not nailed down incurred costs, that would then preclude OPC from coming in in the second stage and challenging these management decisions, which I'm sure is not what they want. Any further questions? All right, well, for the reasons stated in our brief and argued here today, we will respectfully request this court affirm all five orders. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may it please the court, I'm Daniel Norby from Shutson Bowen on behalf of Duke Energy Florida. Uh, in the interest of efficiency, I'll be presenting argument on the legal issues that are common to all of Florida's investor-owned utilities. But if the court has specific questions about the record of any utility other than Duke Energy, I'll defer to counsel for that company for those specific questions. Based on the questioning so far, it appears that the court understands our arguments uh, based on the statutory text and structure. That Florida's Storm Protection Plan statute establishes two distinct proceedings at the Public Service Commission each of which is governed by different standards. Uh, the Office of Public Counsel's interpretation is contrary to the text and the structure of 366.96 and should be rejected on that basis. I'd, I'd like to start by actually addressing the cost recovery order that is here as part of the consolidated appeals, because the Office of Public Counsel in their briefing has not raised any independent challenges to the elements of cost recovery that the Commission awarded to the utilities here. The only issue is this overarching argument about the Commission 
not conducting a prudence review in the plan in the separate plan approval proceeding. But there, there's nothing in, in public counsel's briefing, for example, challenging any item of cost recovery and, and arguing that there's no competent substantial evidence supporting recovery of that element. In fact, they didn't even raise those arguments below. So as, as we've outlined in our brief, those arguments are, are not properly before the court. They've not been preserved. They've been waived on appeal, and they should be approved on that basis. Uh, to the extent the court wanted to look in the record for competent substantial evidence, uh, there's ample evidence in the record, as we've outlined in our brief, supporting each element of the cost recovery order. On the Storm Protection Plan approval order, uh, the Commission's final order here uh, outlines uh, each of the four factors in subsections 4A through D that the Commission is required to consider before determining whether to approve the plan in the public interest. And the Commission here did that. The Commission's order here explains each of those elements, the standard that applies, the evidence that was presented, um, and those are the factors that the Commission must consider in determining whether the plans should be approved in the public interest. Uh, the, the prudence determination statutorily by text and structure uh, comes into play, as, as Chief Justice Meany said, in the implementation stage. Uh, how the utility implemented an approved storm protection plan if it did it in a way that was imprudent. Uh, and we've given examples in our briefing of ways that a particular implementation may be imprudent but the, the decision to engage in uh, transmission vegetation management, as outlined in a plan, is not subject to an after-the-fact review at the cost recovery stage. So prudence in this area is kind of a term of art, but you, I mean, you agree that sort of the cost-benefit, sort of does this make sense, is it a rational thing to undertake this plan? I mean, that is, that is part of the initial review of the plan, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, 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 paragraph 4C of the statute requires the Commission to consider the estimated costs and benefits to the utility and its customers of making the investments proposed in the plan. So that, that goes into the mix of public interest determination uh, separately from a decision of prudence because, as, as uh, the Commission's counsel explained, the prudence review that the Commission determines is, is a review of costs that have been incurred to determine whether the decisions that have, have been made or the costs that have been incurred are consistent with what a reasonable utility, utility manager would have done in those circumstances, backward looking. A prudence review does not, uh, in the traditional prudence review, the Commission does not allow for a determination of what will happen eight years in the future under a plan that's, that's described in general terms and, and will be back for a renewal. Even and so time. to get to their other point then, obviously if you have things that can be compared apples to apples, you can kind of do the dollar thing. How, what, what inputs does the commission need to be able to rationally do a cost benefit? analysis, and I don't use that in any kind of hyper-technical sense, but just sort of what a reasonable person would consider to be kind of a, you know, a sense of it. what are the, is, is this, is, the, is it worth, you know, what I'm getting out of it, is it worth it? What, what, in, what data do they need or information do they need? Sure. So, so each utility here, this was the first fully adjudicated storm protection plan proceeding. Each utility chose to present its evidence in a slightly different format, and uh, we don't quibble with the methodology applied by any particular utility. Um, what the rule requires and what the statute requires uh, is uh, it, the rule specifically requires a description of, of the costs, a description of the benefits, and a comparison of the two. Uh, what neither the rule nor the statute requires is what you might consider an economic cost-benefit analysis where the, the benefits have to outweigh the costs in order for the plan to be approved. And, and that makes good sense given what we're considering here. Um, it, it may be costly to employ storm hardening in, uh, in the Tampa Bay region, but you wouldn't say just because we haven't had a direct Category 5 hurricane impact in Tampa Bay that there are no benefits simply because there was no need for those hardening measures to take effect. We didn't have customer interrupted minutes. So the, 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 neither the statute nor the rule is particularly prescriptive in what sort of evidence uh, the Commission can evaluate in making those decisions. The Commission here evaluated the evidence produced by each utility and determined that that is one of the four factors was sufficient to find it in the public interest. And so can you help us understand, because obviously we're going to be setting precedent here for how we review these things. And one of my sort of things that's a problem with all of these PSC cases is trying to make sense of our case law on the connection between these decisions that the PSC makes and the standard of review. So 
if I were writing on a blank slate and I have an agency that's being told to make a public interest determination, I would look for sort of a reasoned explanation of why the agency thought that whatever they're approving is in the public interest. And to the extent that that explanation relied on sort of factual findings, I would look for competent substantial evidence to back up the underlying findings. But I don't think that it makes sense to just sort of have an agency assert that something is in the public interest without explanation. And I'm not saying that that's what happened here, but without explanation. And then we're supposed to kind of comb through the record to see are there facts in here that a rational person might think. Because then we're sort of replacing the agency as the one sort of doing the thinking. So when we're reviewing this, what is your understanding as to what it is that the agency is supposed to do? And then what are we supposed to be looking for in terms of reviewing it? So do they have to give an explanation of, for example, like in the hypo that you gave, you know, yes, it's all these costs, and yes, there hasn't been a storm in 10 years, but, you know, if there were a storm, it would have this, you know, catastrophic effect, and therefore it's reasonable, blah, blah, blah. Do they have to give that kind of an explanation, and then do we look for the underlying facts to be supported, or is there something else that we're doing? Well, I certainly agree that if, if the commission is making, or any agency is making factual determinations, that this court reviews that to determine whether there is any competent substantial evidence in the record to support those factual findings, notwithstanding that there might be evidence in the record that would support the opposite view. Um, so is the public interest determination a factual finding? The, the public interest determination, I think, has a, a mix of two different things. There's, there's an aspect of it that is a factual finding and would have to be based on the other aspects of, uh, that are outlined in, in the particular order here and whether the facts are supported in the record. A public interest determination, though, also has, uh, is infused with some policy considerations. The commission is, is established as uh, the expert agency on this area, and they pl apply policy reasoning in addition to those facts to arrive at that determination. The, the Administrative Procedure Act does not explicitly require uh, what, what you suggested is a, a reasoned explanation for why they applied their policy in that particular way. So, isn't, why isn't it implicit, though? Because otherwise, what's the point of having these experts who can, you know, intelligently sort of consume all this data and then make a reasoned determination of what is in the best, you know, public interest to the state. I mean, what's the, I mean, either you guys aren't doing, not you, but her, or we're wasting our time here because if all it is, because obviously anybody can put anything they want in the record, and then if the agency can just assert this is in the public interest, and we're supposed to go and say, well, if they believe such and such witness, it's over, then it just seems like this whole thing is a waste of time. So, so I, I would agree to, to, to one extent. I'd agree that the public interest, uh, an evaluation of the public interest determination is, is a very deferential standard of review. Um, it must be based on the record. If, the, if an agency puts something, it establishes, uh, says that something is in the public interest for reasons that are not supported by the record, that would be a basis for this court to decline it. Or if it determines that something is in the public interest based on a consideration of factors that the statute prohibits the agency from considering, that would be a basis for this court to review. In, in this particular case, though, what we have is a, is a public interest uh, determination, uh, and we have each of the factors considered in this order. This order, the one here today, isn't, for example, uh, an order of the commission uh, establishing something with no discussion of a major issue that was disputed between the parties below. This order outlines each of those, and, and this court may have seen some of those we in, have. in prior cases. We have seen them a lot. Um, and I guess that's the thing. I'm just trying to understand what we should be setting as a precedent for what we're going to do here. Because if we have another area of the law where we have a discretionary decision that we're reviewing, and then we're just sort of like mindlessly saying that we're going to apply competent substantial evidence, it just seems like we're setting up, you know, yet another area of the law that makes no sense. So I, I would say just two, two brief responses, in, in if, if I may, on, on time. One is, is uh, if you're writing on this, I would, I would ask you, to, to write that it's, it's a deferential standard. It's not a standard that uh, is, is without any limitations, but it's a deferential standard because it's a, it's a mix of a fact determination and a policy determination, and, and also an emphasis on the fact that it is the burden of an appellant to identify uh, issues of sufficiency with an order on appeal. Uh, that is not an aspect of the challenge that OPC has raised here. They've not challenged the sufficiency of the order in its explanation. And so for that reason, we'd ask that that one be, be affirmed, both the storm protection order and the cost recovery order. 
Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And I, I want to make point something out that is that is a clear issue here. I, if I understood what the commission and um, Council for Duke represented, is that they agree that a cost benefit analysis of some sort should be done in this matter. However, that is not what happened in these cases. The commission stated in all five orders that no cost benefit analysis was required, and they well, did not conduct doesn't, one. Let's let's go to the rule. So 25-60303 sets out what um, gives gives some meat to what we're talking about. We've been having a fairly abstract discussion, but there is a um, uh, a, a list, a description of each proposed storm protection program that includes, and then it enumerates five factors. The one I will focus on is number four. A comparison of the costs identified in subparagraph, the one above, and the benefits identified in subparagraph, the one above. So comparison. The rule requires a comparison. So instead of saying a cost-benefit analysis, let's take the rule. Is it, is it your position that no compare in the 40-some thousand pages of this record, there's no comparison of that nature? No, Your Honor, there's not. The commission did not conduct an evaluation of, especially with Florida Power and Light and FPUC, because those utilities didn't provide the estimates that were required by this rule. But when you look at the orders themselves, even the headers for the section um, in each order, it says, what are the estimated costs and benefits? Is Council for Duke wrong? Do you, in fact, challenge the sufficiency of the explanation given by the commission? In this case? Yes, Your Honor, because they did not consider the prudence or cost effectiveness of any of these plans. So what I was saying was that the, the commission asked, what are the estimated costs and estimated benefits? And the conclusion paragraph in each of those sections of each order is that the costs are X and the benefits are X if they were even provided. That PUC order didn't even list what the benefits were because those weren't provided. Um, they did not consider anything. They just said, what are the costs, what are the benefits, and moved along with the order. They did not consider prudence. They did not conduct an evaluation. They did evaluation, comparison, analysis, whatever you want to call it. All they did was essentially treat the statute like a checklist and say, these are the costs, these are the benefits. We stamp this as the being in the public interest. No analysis was done, and that is clear from the record. I understand that Certain parties are agreeing that the analysis is required, but that is not what happened here, and the record is clear about that. I don't really read your brief, though, as um, raising the specific issue about the sufficiency of the explanation. I mean, I know we're, it's got a little bit of the jurisprudence here is a little bit of a moving target, but I don't, I don't really, I don't really view you as making the kind of argument that you're being asked about. We argue that the sufficiency of these orders, or that these orders are insufficient because they did not conduct a prudence and cost effectiveness evaluation as required by the text of the statute and the rule. So these orders are deficient and insufficient because they do not carry out the legislative mandate that the commission is required to carry out by ensuring that the prudence of the utility investments that are passed along to customers are prudent. That's the, that's the root issue of the insufficiency of these orders. Is there any other situation where that prudence determination that you're asking about is done prospectively? Yes, Your Honor. And, and where was that? So um, within our initial brief, I believe it's the second argument, there are situations where prudence um, is done prospectively. For example, in that situation, it was a, there's a statute. It's for uh, nuclear and integrated gasification combined cycle plants. And the, um, the commission is required, and, and there are, uh, we included a quote where the commission stated that when you're looking at prospective investments, prudence is what's at stake. Prudence is what needs to be determined. And the commission said that when they considered this prospective, um, whether or not they should approve this plant. This is a storm protection plan. This is a prospective review that the commission must conduct. And the prudence of this plan is required by all parts of section three of chapter 366. And again, I know I've harped on this before, but the fact that the legislature did not include a, a statement at the beginning of the storm protection statute to say notwithstanding 366061 and the prudence requirements there, here's what the commission must consider. 
the legislature used the word notwithstanding 16 different times in Chapter 366, and not once did they say that word in the storm protection statute. The prudence requirement of 366.061 is essential to the commission's job. But in the statute, it, it, the statute we're looking at does talk about prudence. It just talks about it in the, in the second phase. But that doesn't mean the first phase isn't also subject well. But when they when they talk about public interest there, and then they talk about prudence, it's not like the legislature forgot prudence, or that there's somehow they they're acknowledging there's this overlay. They're making some distinctions about the way this particular process will roll. And it seems to me, just from looking at it and the, 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 looking at that text in context. Well, in order to find that something is in the public interest, it has to be prudent. The I know, but you're, you're you're I think you're getting yourself off track by using a term that has this kind of specialized meaning. I mean, your point is that it cannot be in the public interest if there's not a rational connection between the costs and the benefits. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. And that's totally within the four corners of the statute. You don't need to get into 366.061, whatever. Um, do you want to, you have 30 seconds Yes, to Your Honor. That. I would just close by saying that um, The SPP statute authorized an additional form of cost recovery for utilities, but it did not absolve the commission of its responsibilities, um, of its otherwise responsibilities. The Florida Public Service Commission has abdicated its responsibility to conduct this cost effectiveness requirement as required by the text of the statute and the rule. And OPC asks that this court reverse and remand all five orders back to the commission so that the commission can do their job, conduct this cost-effectiveness evaluation, and determine the prudence and cost-effectiveness of these investments before these billions of dollars are invested. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll now take up our last case for today, which is Florida Bar versus Mirabal, number 2021-1469. May it please the court, Chief Justice, Justices, Counsel for the Florida Bar. My name is Herman Russomano III, and I'm counsel for Miguel Mirabal, who's the respondent in this matter. The issue before the court today is, even if the court were to find 
that the bar has proven by clear and convincing evidence that Mr. Maribel's actions were knowingly. Were the appropriate sanction would be, under Standard 7.1b, imposing Lawrence sanctions, that a one to three year suspension, rehabilitation suspension, would be appropriate versus a disbarment. Um, for purposes of background, the proceedings are, after the Florida Bar filed its complaint, knew all of the facts in support of its complaint, Florida Bar and other counsel for Mr. Maribel consented to a 90 day suspension with probation. The referee, same Judge Casey, down in Fort Lauderdale, referee judge entered a 20 page opinion, facts and law, in support of that 90 day suspension. This court rejected it, remanded it down. Back in December, there was three days of, of hearings on the matter. Final hearing occurs. The amended report, which is the operative report today, occurs. Recommendation of disbarment. So the standard for today and for the court to address is um, this court, despite the facts of the guilt factors, in reviewing its sanction, has the ultimate responsibility to enter the appropriate sanction, and the key is the existing case law. And that's a recent, the Bruce Jacobs case out of this court recently in 2023. We know that plenty of cases of precedent in which disbarment is an ex extreme measure of discipline. Quote, and this is from the Soraya's case, 2004, never to be decreed where a punishment less severe would be accomplished by desired end. In the Summers case, the court cites the language that's cited many, many times. Disbarment is rare, and it, where rehabilitation is highly improbable, it's the equivalent of the death penalty in a criminal case. It's our position that Mr. Maribel can be rehabilitated. He can, with a one to three year suspension, which undoubtedly is severe suspension. Standard 7.1b for imposing lawyer sanctions provides suspension is appropriate when a lawyer knowingly engages in conduct that is a violation of a duty owed as a professional, causes injury, and it's a potential injury to the client, the public, and the legal system. The facts of this case fall squarely within that standard. Injury has been alleged, and knowingly engaging in, in actions that Mr. Mebel has admitted to. Counsel, do you think it's appropriate to consider if his actions affected clients uh, in a different way than if his actions affected the legal system as a whole? I, I don't think you can make a distinction because the case law, there's, there's plenty of cases out of this court where if you engage in this conduct as a judge or as lawyer, as a, a herning a potential judge in this case, who became a judge in the 2018 election, or a client, or just the administration of justice, um, I don't think you could distinguish it. I think you have to base it upon the facts of this case, based on the existing case law, which I'll walk through with the court, in that... So can I clarify your argument, then it's not, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're precluded from um, imposing disbarment as a sanction, only that it's inappropriate based course. on the factual issue? Of course. This court's going to make its determination. My job is to advocate that it should be a one to three year suspension for this case which is highly distinguishable from the cases the parties have been addressing. And, and now that we're on the topic, I just want to make a point. And this is interesting because we looked at everything. The referee judge cited the Orta case in reliance upon the disbarment. The bar's brief to their, I commend them for this, in their own answer brief, page 45, they do not dispute that the Orta case is distinguishable from these facts. Orta was serving a three-year suspension after being convicted of tax evasion and then he was hiding Canadian assets from the IRS, the probation, and the Florida Bar. Completely different here. And then in their answer brief, the Bar cites to two cases to, to support a disbarment from Ms. Maribel, Mr. Maribel, which are highly distinguishable and don't apply to this facts. The Kapoki case, 2021. Justice Curiel drafted that and wrote it. That defendant, or that respondent, served 20 days in jail for criminal contempt for lacking candor to the court because he was hiding a settlement agreement of money so his wife didn't get it in a divorce. He was disbarred by this court. And the Hall case is the second case that the bar relies upon in support of its position. Hall 2010, 
The court initially read the brief before oral argument and suspended the lawyer and said, we're going to have oral argument. After oral argument, this court disbarred Hall. He had two felonies for grand theft, for a fraudulent estate agreement, and here's what he did. And the court would remember in 2010, Hall went to a family that had Alzheimer's and fraudulently created a document so that Hall can obtain their property. Those facts... Are those cases just significantly different in kind from the facts here where we have kind of the similarity in hiding the ball in a significant way in an important proceeding, and then you kind of compound that with this affirmative misrepresentation in the letter. I know the facts are different, but why is that so different in kind that they can't inform what this court should do in this case? Because of the harm. The harm involved is completely distinguishable. So the court has to, from a broad scope, look at what harm was done, what harm could have been done. And the fact that you're going to... Here was one of the family members that has Alzheimer's, tricking them into a signed document, recording it in the record in order so the lawyer can get a property for their own interests. It wasn't for a client. It's highly distinguishable from what we're dealing with here. And Mr. Mambles admitted that what his actions... And there's no doubt. He signed the certifications. The briefs are well done on both sides that he knowingly did it. And that's why I focus on the 7.1B on the suspension. And I did this. My former co-counsel, who's now been elevated to the bench, Mr. Tynan and I, when we did our briefs, we looked for all the judicial campaign and propriety cases. And they're in all the papers. We cite to eight cases. Every single one of the cases in which a judge or a potential judge, a lawyer at the time, was engaging in judicial campaign nonsense and no-nos shouldn't be done, they received a public reprimand from this court or up to a 90-day. I looked at all the cases. And specifically, early 2023, recent case, public reprimand, personally soliciting donations, and campaign finance report inaccuracies, similar to this case. Well, I think that case is a little distinguishable. If I know the one you're talking about, there was not a repeated pattern of, you know, inflating and then deflating reports and conveniently forgetting large judgments. You're correct. You're 100% correct. And that's why this court said it's a public reprimand. And that's why I'm asking, advocating, that this court suspend Mr. Maribel for one to three years. Significant punishment difference. So you're right. And that's why I make these distinctions. If this court found that a public reprimand or up to a 90-day was appropriate for now Judge Colony, 2010, this court, campaign finance improprieties, improperly filing financial disclosures. The Fracas-Santino case, 2021, the referee in this case cited to it. 90-day suspension. Misconduct, reckless disregard for the truth, and portraying the opponent as a criminal. In the Kinsey case, 2003, there's a public reprimand, 11 ethical violations by a potential judicial running for judge. I think we could go all day sort of citing cases and where they are on the spectrum. I think maybe your, what I at least would like to hear is what your assessment is of your client's remorse for what happened. Because on the record before us, it would seem to me like that's a significant consideration in determining whether or not disbarment or some form of rehabilitation is appropriate. Good question. And here's the answer. At transcript three, pages 98 through 101, the record shows that Mr. Maribel at the trial, final hearing, expressed his remorse for pages. He expressed his remorse for his actions. He admitted to it. So it's in the record. And not only that, and it's a mitigating factor. The mitigating factor, and I haven't said it yet, but you know it, it's in the briefs. He's never been disciplined by the bar for 20 years, admitted in 2004. So for 20 years, and let's say it's 18 to 17, because that's when he, in 2018, this issue started. He did the right thing up to a certain time and then did the wrong thing. But the wrong thing could be corrected with rehabilitation. It can. A three-year suspension by this court, which he must then, we all know three years is more than three years. He's got to come back and show the bar that he's rehabilitated. It's another burden to establish. But his disbarment, on the facts of this case and the existing law, I respectfully submit it's inappropriate. 
based on the facts of the case, and in addition to the mitigation. Counsel, the, did the, the referee didn't find remorse as a mitigating factor, correct? That's correct. It's not in the report. However, in order to answer Justice Carroll's question, it's in the record. So the referee wrote what the referee wrote. We all have to accept it as it's written, but I wanted to at least address that. It wasn't like he's never been remorseful. It's in the transcript under oath, and he swore to it, and it shows remorse. And admittedly – Well, couldn't we infer that the referee discredited that? You could. You could. Because he did not find it. The referee did not find it. But there was remorse expressed on the record at the trial, so it was. In addition, other penalties and sanctions, which is a mitigating factor, 3.B11, Mr. Mibla voluntarily resigned from the bench. He paid the fine. It's a nominal fine. That's not the issue. He paid the fine to the Florida Elections Commission. The referee found that was a mitigating factor. Character witnesses, there were six of them. The referee found that was a mitigating factor. And in the end, I also cite – we also cite in our papers, and this is interesting, the integrity of a judge. When one attacks another judge, you should never do it. Most lawyers, only a few, are crazy enough to do it. But in terms of this particular fact pattern, there was a letter that was written to the bar that only the bar received. It wasn't disseminated. And why do I reference this? I go back to the Bruce Jacobs case, 2023. I practiced with Bruce in Miami. The things that Bruce wrote in papers, astonishing. This court is suspending him for 91 days. So I just want, for the existing case law, to be evaluated in terms of what the proper reprimand is. In another case, the Ray case, 2001, I know that's before 2015 when this court has set a precedent by saying we're going to put harsher sanctions. I get it. Three letters attacking judges by Ray, and he was this public reprimand. So I want to be brief. My point is that the facts are what the facts are. Even with the knowingly factor, that Mr. Maribel knowingly did what he did, this court under the standard, 7.1b, and under the case law that I've cited in our papers and in oral argument, we respectfully request that this court suspend Mr. Maribel for one to three years with a rehabilitation suspension and not give him the ultimate sanction of a disbarment. Thank you very much. Thank you. May it please the Court, Mark Mason, I'm here on behalf of the Florida Bar. Joining me is Melissa Howland, my paralegal. We are requesting this court approve the referee's recommendation of Mr. Maribel's disbarment from the practice of law. Now, by way of background, I know there was mention of the consent judgment, but what wasn't discussed was the full nature of the misconduct. And I think that's important because this court said in ORTA that cumulative misconduct is dealt with much more harshly than isolated instances of misconduct. So what we have here is a theme. It's in the initial brief. It's in the reply brief where we have conduct that spans three different time periods, the 2018 campaign, those reports, the 2019 JNC application, and then the letter to the bar, three different time periods where either we're having express misstatements being made while he's certifying to the truth of them or he's committing these misrepresentations by omission. And it's repeated. In 2018, he's submitting these campaign reports that are inflating the amount of money he's actually raised, and he's certifying to them each and every month. There was extensive examination on that point, and every time it was, oh, this was an error, this was unintentional, I didn't mean to. These are the constant excuses that were given at the disciplinary hearing. Counsel, do you think whether or not we determine what discipline is appropriate here, do you agree with opposing counsel that this case would be an outlier in comparison with our prior discipline for these types of issues? No, I do not believe it's an outlier, and I say that for a few reasons. I know there's going to be factual distinctions in any case I cite. Certainly Orta, that point was already made that he was subject to prior suspensions, but that's why I also argued Kepke and Hall also referenced. They had no prior discipline, and yet they were disbarred for their dishonesty, which was committed in a judicial proceeding. Now, 
Is there a huge difference with the fact that these, this didn't occur inside a courtroom? I don't believe so. Well, Kep Kepke, yes. and Hall, Kepke and Hall both involved convictions, right? Correct. Of a crime. Yes. There's no conviction here, right? There's no con conviction here. All we have is the, we do have the violation that he stipulated to in that consent order regarding the campaign finance violations. But in just viewing what he did, uh, I think the bar's con uh, concern is not so much the label you put on it, but whether we have a pattern of dishonesty where disbarment is appropriate. So no, we don't have a conviction. We have him stipulating that he violated to uh, a statute regarding his monthly campaign reports, and that has knowing as an element of the offense. Yet he still argued at the disciplinary hearing throughout his initial brief that all of this was unintentional. So the can, question can I, can yes. I ask you the same question I asked the other side about remorse? Mm -hmm. um, certainly, we can find record sites to support a statement about remorse. Um, but we weren't present for the proceedings below. We don't, other than to just sort of reverse engineer what the referee found from the order, we, we can only conclude the referee did not credit those. Is there anything you want to add on that front? Because it would seem to me like that is an important consideration. What I'll say about that is that I can't tell you I've ever read a sanction hearing where the respondent hasn't expressed remorse, because at that point there's been a finding of guilt. Uh, when a referee declines to make a finding regarding the presence of an aggravating or mitigating factor, it's entitled to the same deference you would give if the referee found that mitigating factor. So pointing to record evidence that says my client is remorseful, it doesn't prove that the referee was clearly erroneous in the ruling. It just indicates that the referee didn't accept that testimony by implication, by the fact that it's not in there. And I think that's readily apparent by the fact that you have this referee's report that goes through the litany of misconduct spanning these three different time periods, and then ultimately says, yes, I did originally agree to consent judgment, but that was rejected. I conducted a full hearing. I learned the breadth of what he did, and therefore I am changing my recommendation to disbarment. This wasn't some, some blindside type deal. It was, it, it, throughout the hearing, you were hearing about these campaign reports, you were hearing about the JNC application where he was omitting six civil cases, number does, one. It does sort of beg the question, though, about why the bar agreed to the consent judgment in the first place. And the referee addressed that as well, at least from the referee's own perspective, that the original thought was, well, he stepped down from the bench, which was a significant other sanction, which would be a, a, a mitigating factor. That's why originally that was agreed to. But then when ultimately you start doing all of the fact finding, you hear from Judge Abreu, who was the victim of these uh, disparaging claims by Mr. Mirabal regarding her filing of a frivolous suit against someone, which never happened. Uh, and you combine that with the fact that he was also engaging in misconduct in 2018 and 2019 to try and become a judge when integrity was of paramount importance, not only in terms of his campaign, but in terms of the JNC application, when he's required to disclose, uh, you know, name every case where you've ever been a named party. And he omits six out of a total of 15, two of which, very frankly, and this is what the referee found, no one could reasonably forget. One of them was a lawsuit by the FDIC accusing him of engaging in um, mortgage fraud. And then the second one was his suit against Bank of America, which the referee characterized it as it resulted in a very scathing order by a federal judge in which the, the federal judge said he, he drafted a deed in lieu and foreclosure. The bank never agreed to it, but he recorded it in the official records anyway, and then sued on the basis that they violated this agreement that they, no one ever agreed to except Mr. Mirabal. It, it's, it's inconceivable that he would have just forgotten to disclose these things. And the referee found that this would necessarily mean that he was doing that because he didn't want to disclose something that would adversely affect his chances to fill a judicial vacancy. So when you look at the Orta case, it's not so much that uh, it's relevant in terms of the specific facts, because Orta involved income tax evasion, and the lawyer tried to get back into reinstatement and then just lied some more by uh, failing to disclose certain holdings he had in Canada. And then that was uncovered, and then 
he does the same thing where he tries to excuse away what he did. The problem here is we are seeking disbarment because there's just been a constant pattern of dishonesty in these cases that so far has not been addressed. And yes, it's unusual for someone to suddenly get disbarred when they've had a clean disciplinary history, but it has happened before. It has happened in Kepke and Hall. And yes, you could say it's criminal conduct, it's different, but at the same time, when you combine what he did, all of the instances spanning 2018 and 2019, that distinction doesn't look quite as mitigating. Um, so just in terms of the case Can law I that I would- Can ask a question yes. on, on the finding on 4-8.2b, um, which is text, textually applicable to candidates for judicial office. Mm -hmm. That's imposed in the context of the bar discipline proceeding. Um, why is that not inapplicable in that situation when it's in the context of a bar discipline proceeding? Um, it's a letter about a comment of who filed, you know, the complaint, that sort of thing. Uh, yes, the code of judicial conduct violation. Yes. He was running for office at that time. He actually succeeded in that, and that was uh, 2020 when he was appointed to the position. So it became a bar violation. But do you think, regardless of the timing, do you think it needs to be tied to activity in the context of the campaign versus in a disciplinary proceeding? I don't. Or is think it just anything that a candidate does wrong in any proceeding is subject to discipline under that provision? I think it applies when he is a candidate for office, and I don't think it necessarily needs to be tied to the specific race. But, you know, I know there was a big deal made out of that specific rule violation in the reply brief, but we're talking about one instance, the last instance, out of several, and what he did in terms of falsely accusing a judge, a sitting judge, of uh, filing a frivolous suit, which never happened. It violated several rules beside that one. Right. So, so I guess two follow-ups based on that one. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you aware of any cases that support kind of your interpretation that it's untethered to candidacy for judicial office as long as the person who's committing the violation is a candidate for judicial office? And then second, does that matter to our determination? I don't have a case law for that. I would just go by what the Code of Judicial Conduct binds candidates to do in terms of that. And that's why the referee found that he violated the judicial canon through that as well. Hmm. Um, but in closing, um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut off if there are any other questions. Um, but in closing, I would just ask this court to consider the case law, to consider the fact that, um, you know, there is a litany of misconduct that, you know, I didn't hear any argument uh, here today, at least, that it was unintentional. There seems to be at least some kind of concession on that front, but at the same time, this has come a little late in the proceeding when the referee already failed to find that there was any remorse. And I think for that reason, there needs to be um, disbarment from the practice of law in this case. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna be very brief, just to touch on a couple points in rebuttal. The consent of the 90-day suspension in response to Justice Carroll's question, the bar, with all of its ammunition of bar history and case law, after it did its investigation, after it filed its complaint with this court, then entered into a 90-day. So they knowingly entered into that with the existing case law. This court had every right to well, remand we, you it know, we, we know that, right. and, and so, but that's ultimately, we decide what right. was appropriate, and that's why we rejected it and sent it back. So um, I don't really know that that helps you. I mean. I, I acknowledge that. In response to the comments about the three cases the bar is relying upon, Orta, Copel, and Hall, you're right. They're all conviction cases, serious conviction cases. Felonies for tax evasion, put in jail by a judge for hiding assets from a wife in a, in a divorce, and in Hall, worst case scenario, you make an Alzheimer's homeowner sign a document and you have two felonies tacked onto that highly distinguishable from the facts of this case. So I do think it matters that those are conviction cases which the bar is relying upon versus we don't have one here. In terms of, of mitigation, a huge factor is that Mr. Manable has no prior discipline. It's a huge factor. And there are several factors that the court found and did not find. And it's gonna be up to this court to determine and weigh those factors. And finally, the Lawyers Imposing Sanction Standard 7.1b allows this court to enter a suspension. 
when a respondent knowingly does something. Mr. Maribel admits that he knowingly did these things, and therefore we respectfully request that this court impose a one to three year suspension because he can be rehabilitated. He can. Well, Thank counsel, let me, let me say this. The, the, the rehabilitation issue comes into, into, the, into play primarily where we're determining uh, that a disbarment will be permanent. And that's like, go away, don't come back, ever. Um, this is not a permanent disbarment, is it? It's not. It's okay. 10 years. A disbarment of 10 years is a huge... Five. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> it's five years. Um, so, uh, again, there would be an opportunity to show uh, rehabilitation uh, after the five years and to come back. So this is not... This is not we're, if we determine, if we, go, if we decide to uphold the, the, the referee's recommendation here, we're not saying that uh, uh, the petitioner here is beyond hope and is beyond redemption. That's not what's being said. It's just saying, that, get out of the bar. And, and uh, if you come back, it's going to be five years from now. I don't disagree, but we all know there's a huge distinction between being disbarred and suspended. In the case law that we've cited, supports a suspension and not a disbarment. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We appreciate the excellent arguments on both sides, and we're adjourned. All rise.